Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Badass Ladies Club. My name is Jessica. I'm here with my bestie, Laurie. What's up, y'all? And we are so excited to bring you this week's episode. We are here with the one and only James Vincent. But before we get to James, we are going to introduce this week's Badass of the Week. I mean... Maybe the, one of the most badass ladies in my entire existence, um, Joan Jett is this week's badass of the week, which is kind of an interesting combination because we'll talk about this a little bit later. James is like Joan's go-to makeup artist anymore. Uh, she has embraced everything about the l- rock star lady girl power, do it yourself, DIY gig from before I was born, uh, creating music and really being a rock star lady before there were rock star ladies. Um, she forged a path that allows us to even just have this podcast today, you know, like Joan Jett is the beginning of women's empowerment and, um, liberation, just as far as being yourself and fully embracing it and just not giving a fuck what anybody else has to say about that. Um, so, you know, you can trace back her career in music for decades, but really I, one of my favorite things about Joan is how she embraces future generations of badass ladies moving forward. I feel like she's such an awesome example. And, um, so yeah, we want to honor, honor Joan and everything that she's contributed to, uh, women just being themselves unapologetically and doing your own thing and being really freaking successful, but in your own way. Cause I, it's another thing that I love about her is like, she's a massive success, but in ways that make sense to her, you know, and in ways that are important to her. So we honor you, Joan. Thank you for all of your badass example to us. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, moving it right into makeup because (laughs) I, you know, makeup artists are obviously a big part of our world every day, but James, it's so awesome to have you on the podcast. I got to say like, this is a, uh, we've been waiting for this moment. We really have. Um, (laughs) so how's it going, man? How are you doing? Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I am uh, very excited to be here with you guys and to celebrate the badass of the week. One of my favorite ladies and, uh, favorite people. So well, very honored. Speaking to of, first of all, I don't know if this is public knowledge, but at our salon for Halloween, we were lady rock stars mm-hmm. and I mean, from the moment we came up with the idea, Laurie was like, I call Joan Jett. Nobody can be Joan Jett. So it's like, <laughs> I will cut you if you try and take Joan Jett from me. Like. The black wig, <laughs> did the smoky eye. It was I did Gwen Stefani, which is really funny. I didn't plan this, but I'm wearing my Gwen you Stefani pants. You are kind pants, of doing Gwen, yeah. My right. um, <laughs> no doubt pants that I'm wearing. But um, so we're going to have a fangirl moment. Sorry, James, but we just have to ask. We're obsessed with Joan. We're obsessed with her style and her career and her impact on rock and roll. What is something about Joan Jett that would surprise us? Um, I think that people would be surprised that she is, you know, I think people always see the badass part of Joan Jett. Um, but I think she's so altruistic in everything she does. She spends a lot of time on military bases, even in war zones, um, performing for troops, regardless of whether the person in the White House has her politics or not. She spends a lot of time with PETA. Um, She does a lot for women's organizations. Every city she goes to, everything she does with Blackheart, um, she's very passionate about veganism and, and animal rights and women's rights. And I think that that is very aligned with her being a badass, you know, but I think that people might see some of that as very gentle and she is just authentic in so many ways. Like what you see when she's performing or in an interview is exactly how she is. And I would say the other thing is that she just loves music. Like she, for me, it's very inspirational. She'll pick up a guitar and just start playing in a room full of a few people. And she has just as much passion for that as she does when she's playing in an arena. And I think that that in a long career says a lot when you still love what you're doing. Absolutely. And I also have my, what would Joan Jett do tattoo? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I didn't know you had that Make me an appointment right away. What would Joan Jett do? I'm stealing it. We're about to be tattoo sisters. (laughs) That is brilliant. And then on the other side, I have bitches be fucking crazy. So when you're working with crazy people and you can't say it out loud, you just look at the hair person that you're working with and you're like, Oh 
my God, I'm obsessed. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this. speaking of working in a makeup respect, um, you have got a lot of, you know, like we talk about success is different for so many people. You have a lot of traditional success in the makeup world, whether that be celebrity working on runway, doing editorial, like all assets and varieties. So being a makeup artist in 2021 is a lot different. I find than being a makeup artist was in 2000, even, you know, like it's changed a whole lot. What do you think is one of the biggest drivers behind your success in the business? And then also, could you just speak to this idea that like how much YouTube and online makeup tutorials has changed how to become a professional makeup artist? Um, Well, you know, I've been doing makeup now for 27 years and uh, I've been in New York for 25 and I did have a very traditional career. I didn't go to school for makeup, which most fashion makeup artists of my generation didn't. You know, I was a club kid. Um, My degree is social work. I was writing my dissertation on women of color and the white beauty myth when Mac hired me. And uh, at that time with Mac, you had to be a makeup artist and I really wasn't. And so they put me through weeks of training and mentorship And I was part of the team that launched Mac throughout the southern part of the U.S., from North Carolina down to Florida. Over, I opened the first Mac locations in Texas, in Houston at the Galleria, which I think is where you guys are. Yeah. And uh, then I left Mac. Urban Decay moved me to New York City. I launched Urban. I launched Stila. But at the same time, I was assisting makeup artists like Kevin Aquan and Dick Page. Uh, and kind of went the assistant route and then started doing my own thing. And so it it was a very traditional career in that how we worked in the 90s. Um, And I think that that is one of my driving forces for what I do in the industry now, because I think success in 2000 or in the 90s, there were 100 makeup artists working in New York, you know, and you would assist and you apprenticed under a master artist until they thought you were ready to go out on your own. And as the industry grew, I think that a lot of people lost out on that mentorship. And so schools started to open and cosmetology schools had to deal with the fact that makeup was becoming an industry onto itself. But I think that because makeup is both an art and a craft, I think that the that way of mentorship is so important to me. And so... What I have done in the last few years, last 16, 18 years now with the Powder Group and the Makeup Show and other events, I I spoke on five continents in 2019 um, to makeup artists at every level. And I think that that, for me, it is about keeping this as a community. No matter how many thousands of people call themselves makeup artists now, I think that we have to work to make sure that the title of makeup artist is still something to be proud of. And so I'm a little different than most artists of my generation. I love YouTube. I love the social media aspects of it. I grew up in a really small place. I grew up in, in Rhode Island, which is the smallest of the 50 states. Um, there was no fashion where I grew up. I grew up reading, you know, every magazine and watching music videos. The reason I do makeup is because of photo shoots with, with Debbie Harry and Joan Jett. Um, so I felt very alone and very isolated. And until I moved, I didn't even know makeup was a job, you know? And so I think that there are so many benefits and bonuses to YouTube and Instagram and tutorials putting makeup out there so that people are aware of it. My 13 year old niece wants to be a makeup artist. Like I, you know, it's so she does tutorials Jones. Now I'm telling tales, but uh, (laughs) the president of Blackheart records, Carrie Ann Brinkman, her seven year old daughter uh, is a better, is better at makeup tutorials than I am. You know, I I think that it has changed and morphed what the title and mantle of what makeup artist is. But I don't think it's necessarily positive or negative. I think that really depends on the person who's presenting the information and the the audience doing their due diligence and saying like, is this real information? Is this person actually an expert? I think that if you step away from the idea of numbers and likes and following and really look at the idea of like, sharing information. I think that YouTube and Instagram are are beautifully positive places for makeup artists. But I think that 
like any, you know, um, celebrity driven or popularity driven f focus, it can start to feel overwhelming and daunting for a lot of people. So I hope I answered that question. I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> no, but no I, I do. I, I do have a question that wasn't yeah. planned. You brought it up with assistance. So, I mean, I know it may be different now in the pandemic, but do you have like a couple or one assistant that you work with on a regular basis, like your mentorship that you went through mm -hmm. when you were younger. Um, because what I'm finding as a hairstylist in this industry that I'm having a hard time of letting go of is because that's how I came up in the industry was you apprentice under someone, you work your ass off until they're like, okay, spread your wings and fly. Right. Hairstylists, young hairstylists coming up in the industry, at least in our area of DFW, don't want to do that anymore. Um, I've had a really hard time of letting that go. So do you work with people like that still? I do. Um, That's awesome. I have yeah. my core team and I'm very, you know, the job, the relationship between the mentor and the master is not necessarily one that is just about education. You know, it is not, if you're an assistant or you're an apprentice, it isn't that person's job to take you through something step by step. And so I think that mentorship works well for certain people, but a lot of hairstylists and makeup artists are non-traditional learners. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we also need curriculums. It's why I'm such an advocate for education. But I do think that the day of, you know, pushing your ego aside, you know, there are in so many big jobs that I did as an assistant. That's not my work that I cannot claim. Um, you really have to push your ego aside. As an assistant, you're an apprentice of the makeup artist's arm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you're there to make them look good. And there is something about pushing your ego aside that I think the current generation, right or wrong, um, doesn't necessarily connect to. I think that when everything started coming out this year with, um, you know, so many movements of expression, a lot of people said, well, you can no longer treat assistance this way and we'll no longer, you know, put up with that. But for me, I never really dealt with that as an assistant. Um, I tended to work with people who were very generous and very kind and, huge, huge opportunities in my career. Billy B gave me a Lady Gaga video. Sharon Galt gave me David LaChapelle to work with. You know, Linda Cantello gave me job after job, opportunity after opportunity. Um, so I don't think I ever saw that negative side that many people felt like they were being abused as like an assistant. Like are taken advantage so, of. And yeah. yeah. So I think because I had such a positive experience, I really take on assistance yeah. and I have a great team. I have artists all over the world. I key about 12 shows a season for New York Fashion Week with Danessa Myricks. We have about 700 people that reach out for 12 spots. We choose 12 people for the season. And Danessa and I just kicked off a new year-long mentorship program called iArtist, which is a 12-month mentorship program where it is um, holistic in its approach. So it's about wellness, it's about branding and business, it's about artistry, but it's also about the self. It's about kind of stepping forward and putting plans in place and self-actualization because I think that mentorship now has to be different because it's a different industry. Yeah. You know, we are no longer just behind the chair and we're no longer anonymous. And so I think that we have to prepare this current, you know, generation of hairstylists, makeup artists, estheticians to see themselves as a brand in a business and as an individual who deserves and demand, should demand respect. And I think that I find that to be very positive. I also think that in an industry that's so female focused, um, we haven't always seen women in the leadership roles where we need them. So we also kicked off a new program this year called Girl Interrupting, which is about building female bosses, female executives, female photographers, female editors. Um, I think that that also, when you see different people's stories and everything's not shot through a male gaze, you also start to see mentorship and 
compassion and camaraderie and things that haven't really always had a place in a competitive business, if that makes sense. It makes so much God, sense. Everything you said just blew my mind yeah. and I'm done with this interview. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Mic drop. Um, yeah. You know what, Jessica? Yeah, and I if have... you guys want to check out the mentor program, hop on for the next session with Vanessa and I. Uh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, I know everything of real value in my makeup career, especially when I was young and coming up, was because I was assisting somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was uh, the things that I learned just through watching true professionals do their craft. You know, yeah. if anything else, it just gave me this barometer of how far I had to go. Like yeah. that she didn't make it look that easy because she just woke up and knew how to do it, you know, like that. And so it was always a really, um, at the end of working with somebody as an assistant, I just always could walk away with so much perspective that, um, I'm, and I guess all of that shifting into, you know, you just did the makeup show virtual of what month ago, two, six weeks ago, you know, like it was recently what a big change that was to go from an in-person education event with a live expo and a main stage and all of these breakout classes. And then you shifted the whole thing and then you guys produced it and put it out online. Like well done because it was so awesome. It was amazing and not, Mm -hmm. you know, it was functional. It still had the feel and the vibe of the makeup show that I've been to in so many cities over the years. Like just, your commitment to still getting that out there for people. Like, I don't know that I wouldn't have been like, sorry, y'all this in the year for the makeup show. Like right. we'll catch up with you when this the pandemic's over. Yes. Um, so yeah, taking things to the next level virtually like that had to be a big undertaking. You want to talk a little bit about a uh, virtual makeup show and how that shifted things? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I get, I am the one who gets a lot of the applause and recognition because I'm the one who's on camera, but really Shelly Tugar, who is the owner of the makeup show yeah. and the team really are responsible for building it and putting together all the back end and doing all of that. And it was a big undertaking. And the thing that I love about Shelly and I love about my makeup show um, family is the commitment to the community because we got hit really, like I'm in New York City. And so our COVID experience has been very different than the rest of the country. Um, We all were sick before lockdown. All of our artists had got COVID, um, some of them hospitalized multiple times. Our entire makeup show staff got COVID, some of them hospitalized multiple times. We've lost probably a dozen friends, you know, and at that point in the virus, we had trucks on the streets, you know, just full of bodies and businesses were closing and people were fleeing and um, Shelly from her you know, being sick, called me and she said, you know, the community is scared. Um, And we had been working with the CDC. We were on our way to Texas, actually, to Houston. And uh, we had been working with the CDC, working with the Professional Beauty Association, working with state and local authorities. And that's when they said, not only is this not going to happen, but we don't know when it will be back. And in the first few weeks of the pandemic, Shelly saw so much fear. I was getting hundreds and hundreds of messages a day from artists all over the world who were just saying like, what do we do? What comes next? I have no work. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Shelly very quickly after kind of recuperating said, we've got to figure out a way to connect because it isn't just the education and the inspiration, I think, that people look for with the makeup show, but the idea of community and connection. And so the virtual show is something we had been talking about. I think that the pandemic just kind of pushed it forward because my goal with the makeup show is really to kind of decolonize beauty and make it accessible. But um, one of the things that I learned when I was working on Fenty with Rihanna was that you know, we're, we talk about accessibility, but price point mm. really is about accessibility. So how can I say that the makeup show is like truly accessible if someone can't afford a flight to New York City or Houston or LA, you know? And mm. so with virtual, it was fantastic. We had 20 different keynotes. We had hundreds of seminars and panels and shopping, huge discounts. But the thing that was the most exciting was to see presenters from five different continents, so many different languages. Um, We had attendees from, I think, 27 different countries 
uh, five, like different time zones. Like it was kind of really amazing. And it just inspired me to say, this is a global industry. And this is a, a global industry where at, there's a place for everyone. And, and um, I think the virtual show really put a spotlight on that. So thank you. I, I, the success belongs to the team I hosted and I, you know, help put it together, but the building of it is really Shelly and the team. So, and all of that is available for rewatch. If people want to see some of that education, it's all available on the makeup show website. Awesome. Yeah. I have met Shelly a handful of times at shows and stuff. She really is wonderful. Um, and I can just speak badass. to, yeah, she's super <laughs> badass. Um, just the production of doing this podcast, you know, like we obviously have our producer, Paul, that does all of the techie stuff in the background. Like I know our podcast would not be the same if we were like trying to figure it out in my guest bedroom, which was the original plan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it takes a team to pull off anything, uh, especially something at that scale. Yeah. Um, so we've been a little bit obsessed here lately with, um, different people's branding and personal style, you know, like a big part of the badass ladies club is our own personal brands and, you know, like us putting those two things together and creating something together that has a really strong feel about it. So is there anything that like, what kind of icons influences do you think came together with your personal brand and style? Cause you definitely have a very distinct look, you know, and people recognize your brand, um, because you embody that. So who helped you build that personal brand? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'm just texting Jeremy cause I want him to bring a new candle that you guys haven't seen. Ooh, oh my yeah. gosh. Um, I see. You know, I think it, it, Personally, I think that I never realized that, um, you know, music, music growing up, album covers, mm -hmm. you know, Debbie Harry's album covers, Joan Jett album covers. They're the reason I do makeup, Fleetwood Mac. Um, I always like in my mind, I kind of look like Stevie Nicks, like yes. when I dress like certain ways or Joan Jett. But like, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I was always the weird fat kid. I always was very quiet. I would kind of sit by myself in the cafeteria and draw in books. I, I remember entire, entire days in high school where I didn't speak. You know, I always was smart. I did very well in school, but I didn't really enjoy it. And uh, I had great teachers. And so I think that I kind of didn't, I, I don't know. I was like, I was insecure, but I never really cared what people thought. It was like, I just, and I see it with my 13 year old niece now. I had to dress the way I had to dress. There was no other option for me. And I went to Catholic school. So like Same. figuring out ways to like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> sneak something through in Catholic school was not easy because <laughs> it was uniforms. Yeah. And feel that. Uh, I don't know. And so female rock and roll and rock and roll were always places that I went to, <clears throat> there were just, I think there were just so many people that influenced me with their style. And then I don't think I put language to it until a few years ago. I was um, at the Brooklyn Museum with a friend of mine and we saw the Georgia O'Keeffe exhibit, mm. which I love, you know, it, it just was more about her clothing and her furniture and her sketchbooks than just her final paintings. And when I looked, I said, oh, my God, she lives her aesthetic. And mm -hmm. then I went with Paloma Romo. I was speaking at a show in Mexico. And we went to Casa Azul, Danessa Myricks, Paloma Romo and I, and walking around and seeing, you know, another artist like Frida Kahlo, who also dressed a certain way, her house looked a certain way. I started to realize that our aesthetic is so influential to our artistry. And I think that I, I've always had a very strong opinion. I, I think that there's definitely a New York kind of rock and roll influence on everything I do. But more than anything, there's kind of an activist DIY um, inclusivity. And I think that comes from the badass women that I grew up listening to and the bands that I loved and the artists that I, and the writers, you know, the people that I read, the, the things that I listen to, we curate our aesthetic and we pull in things that inspire us. And then I think as artists, especially in competitive industries like hair and makeup, you have to be able to put that forward so that people can say, okay, 
this is someone that I want to work with for this. And I, I have lost a lot of jobs in my life. Like my first agency had me on diet pills. Oh my God. You know, I wore, I would think I was a 34 inch waist then. Um, you know, I've lost television gigs because people thought I was too fat. I lost a, a big client because she got a new manager and the woman hated tattoos. Like, but the way I've always wow. kind of thought of it is like, this is me. And these, the way that I look also weeds out the people I don't want to deal with, right. you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, so I really now am very much about helping artists figure out their aesthetic as well as their artistry, because I think they go hand in hand. You know, I think at a time where there's so much information available in the universe, it becomes about curating. So you need to curate your portfolio, your website, your social media, but yourself, you know, and put that forward and then find the people that are attracted to it. I think it's allowed me to stop thinking of the hustle, you know, the hustle where there's such a lie with the American hustle, you know, just keep doing it, just keep going, take everything that comes your way. And when you find your aesthetic and and your authenticity, I think you can step back and say, no, it isn't about a hustle. It's about alignment. Mm -hmm. Am I really putting things out there that are allowing me to get the clients that I want to work with, to create the type of work that I want to create and the type of artistry I want to create. And it also allows you to stop thinking about what you're putting forward as content, which I think is so detrimental sometimes and really realize that we're creating art. When you do a child's first haircut or you put someone's hair together for their prom like these are major moments of curation in their life right major Mm -hmm. memory moments and so I think that we have to see ourselves as artists and aesthetic is part of that you know I I love everything you're saying because I feel that so much um especially in my life you know I'm a mom of an almost five-year-old girl. And sometimes I get caught in these, um, like in my head about dropping her off at ballet, you know, dressed in my black leather jacket with my studded boots. And, you know, I look like I'm about to kick someone's ass, but really, you know, like I'm not, I feel like I have this really rough exterior, but, um, you know, I'm always like, Oh, and I don't really fit in with the other moms and, you know, um, but what has really surprised me is that people who are going to love and accept your aesthetic, um, they're drawn to you anyway. And, you know, I even have older clients at the salon who compliment me on my aesthetic all the time. And when I tell them like, Oh, thank you. You know, sometimes people don't like it. They're like, they're just old fashioned. It's like these old little ladies (laughs) telling me this. It's so cute. I love it. It's fun. I I think the sense of individual can be scary for some people, Mm -hmm. you know, especially with, with women, especially in, um, in an industry that is, about how you look, you yeah, know, yeah. I think there are some people who have kind of followed the path and they want to look like whatever the popular look is. That's never been me. You know, I've always been sister outsider. So <laughs> I kind of function the opposite way. I'm like, oh, this is what everybody's watching. This is what everybody's listening to. I, I have never connected with that. You know, when people say, oh, this is the most popular movie, I'm like, oh, I probably am not going to enjoy it. Or this is popular music. Like, I'm like, I I don't really get it. You know, so I think, yeah, like we are we a little on the edge? Are we a little outsider? Yes. But I think our creativity pushes us there. And I think for people who live with, you know, within the margins and we're on the fringes, it can feel a little daunting sometimes or you'll find people who find it very inspirational because they never did it themselves you know so a lot of times what you find with hairstylists is they want to go to the one with the who looks the most different than they do because they want to feel like they're being edgy even when they're not but Mm -hmm. I have you know, Jeremy laughs because I, I call them muggles, but I have like, I have never had a desire to be a muggle, like to, to struggle to the middle, you know, yeah, like, yeah. oh, I really hope, I hope I can be popular because media, it's so mediocre. Like I would rather be controversial and do things that are important to me. And, you know, when you're dropping the kids off at school, you probably are getting some looks from some of the moms, but then they are like, I wish I could, oh, I wish Absolutely. I could do that. She's so interesting, mm-hmm. you know, and then they go and put on their same yoga pants as the six moms. <laughs> next to them. Right. Like, 
it's total know. truth. It's, it's brave. Sure. It's, it, it takes bravery to be yourself, right? To be authentic. And more than ever today. Yes. Yeah, like it really is a truth uh, piece there. I'll tell you what I am loving uh, with your new directions is we've got to talk about rebels and outlaws only because yes. Jessica and I have become uh, definite customers and are buying up all of your candles and brush cleaners and room sprays and all of it. Um, we have a candle out on yes. our we desk got back here to black if anyone's out. watching. Oh, back to you. Black is out there. Um, so before we get into like products and all of that, I w really am curious what motivated the birth of Rebels and Outlaws because to go from the makeup gig and then, you know, we're going to talk about your activism and stuff a little later, uh, moving into this space where you're creating all of these tools for to create ritual and sacred space seemed like a shift for me. So where did that come from? Um, you know, it, I had always, I've always made candles and I had, um, I've always made my own toners and hand sanitizers. It's just always been part of like my family and, and kind of what I do. I, I love working with essential oils and hydrosols and I've always done product development. I've had two makeup lines of my own one uh, in the early 2000s. I had a line called Pretty Pretty, which was uh, well received. I won Vogue Newcomer of the Year, WWD Newcomer of the Year, um, but I just couldn't couldn't make it work in the competitive climate. And then the last brand that I was with Arden CN, um, again, like pushing boundaries. So I've always done product development. And then Jeremy and I were working on the Fenty project with Rihanna. It was a huge project. They launched in 17 countries on the same day. I interviewed over 2,800 makeup artists for Rihanna, including about 700 in the Dallas area. And uh, they, can, they had kind of offered me a position. And I haven't worked for a brand other than my own in decades. And it was a great title. It was a great salary. Um, and I, I really had to consider but it also came with giving up things that I love, like the makeup show and, and things like that. And I did an artist retreat that I do every year with a powder group called Evolution. Mm -hmm. Michael DeVellis and I run uh, an artist retreat for 20 people every year. And it really kind of put things into focus for me. And when I came back, Jeremy, who's my business partner and husband, said, well, what are you going to do? Are we moving? Are you taking the job? And I said, I, I, I don't think I want to. And it was such a crazy salary. I think we both were like, <laughs> like Rihanna, <laughs> let's be honest, Rihanna, and, uh, come on. Yeah. And then Bye. he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I, I kind of want to make candles. And he was like, okay. And he bought me a, a better candle making kit so that I could kind of do a little more. And it was really the idea of, I think on this retreat, what I really started to notice was that as things became more forward facing with YouTube and Instagram and podcasts and all of these things. Makeup artists were working in a different way. I was leaving the best of myself with my clients most days and then coming home depleted. And so I wanted to find ways to help us prepare our space, protect our energy, curate something for our client, be more mindful in our makeup applications or, you know, hair consultations. And so I thought, well, I've always worked with color and crystals and herbs and florals and fragrance. And so I wanted to kind of develop these unguided meditation candles where you could burn the candle or not burn the candle and just having it in your space will be able to bring something across, um, but also set intentions. And then I did hand sanitizers, brush cleaners, toners, because I think those are also part of it. Like when you're getting your makeup out of your brush, mm -hmm. Um, you want to get rid of that energy too. So I did actually with a Texas based artist, uh, the crazy merman who's based in Dallas, yeah. we developed a new vegan formula that it gets rid of past energy and past pigment and even waterproof. And so it was just kind of this thing. And then it started to get so crazy that Jeremy quit his job. It's now full time. And we're introducing new product all the time. And we've done collaborations with Smashbox and Alcone and, uh, you know, other, uh, the oddities flea market and we just keep, it just keeps going. And I really love it. It's like, it's the most me thing that I've done. It you know, definitely right? comes through yeah. for sure. I, I actually, I don't know if we have time, but I was going to finish a candle for you guys. Yes. So you let's do it. Oh my God. Yes. Show us. Yeah. 
All right. So this is in my um, witch box for March, which W-H-I-C-H box. And every month I create a new box. So this candle, I'm just going to heat it up for a moment. Okay, y'all. I'm just saying, if you're not watching on YouTube right now, yeah. you need to be... Hit the YouTube link. Yeah. Oh. So the candles start with organic soy wax. Everything we use is ethically sourced and organic. We work with all female-owned and small-owned businesses. This is rose quartz for beauty. It's a traditional lavender and sage uh, lavender colored candle for spring, for Easter and Ostara. And then I'm adding in rose quartz for beauty, amethyst for sight and vision, moss agate, which is about healing trauma, which I think people really need right now and healing the heart, citrine for happiness and joy and success. And then I finish it with organic herbs. These are all grown by a makeup artist here in New Jersey. This is lime basil for money and prosperity and abundance. Lavender flower for peace and tranquility. Uh, A little lemongrass for moving forward. And some purple sage, which is about protection, but also about... uh, Letting the past behind, you know, leaving the the year behind us. And so it's just, you know, it's a very, uh, every part of the process is really handmade from the coloring to the pouring to the finishing. And then I sigil them and send them out to clients. So it's, uh, it, for me, it's about what's coming next, you know, like my legacy, I don't think will be a music video or a magazine cover, but hopefully helping a makeup artist or hairstylist or esthetician find their voice and find their place and find their path, you know, in the industry. And so I think that these products hopefully allow people to be able to have a little bit of peace and, and, you know, Okay. So, and mindfulness. So, <laughs> we're like crying. First of over all, here, we're like, like, oh my God, is my eyeshadow running? Good thing we wore smoky eyes no today. <laughs> um, um, wow. Yeah. It's so fitting that you did all this. I was just having a conversation with Laurie yesterday about, um, you know, how much I love. I love my career clients. If you're listening, I love my career. I love my time behind the chair with you. It is extremely draining sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of depletion and what you said earlier with leaving your best version of yourself with your guest and coming home, just being like, I have nothing else, um, is ringing true with me Mm -hmm. this year, um, feeling it in a big way. And so that demonstration you just did for us was beautiful and wonderful. And thank you so much. I was and I'm not a crier, by the way, James. I'm not. I'm She's not. Totally emotional. not. I'm not yeah. a crier, but that brought tears to my eyes. Thank you so much. I, I think it's important that we yes. remember how difficult this industry can be sometimes. And I think it's so rewarding and there's so much opportunity. Like the thing I love about hair and makeup is it doesn't matter. It's an even playing field. Unlike a lot of industries, it doesn't matter how you identify. If you grew up rich, poor, gay, straight, fat, thin, black, white, speaking English, Spanish. It doesn't matter. Everybody here can be a success if you figure out the pieces. And I think that that allows a lot of people into this industry. And so we accept that it is a tough industry. But the intimacy of the way we work and the importance of what we're doing, I think doesn't always get valued. I think people still see hair and makeup sometimes as a, as a hobby. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you are putting your whole heart and soul into not only your skill set, but then you are bringing your clients through emotional moments like met weddings or even just day to day in the salon through this last year, and you're connecting to them and you're listening to them and you're actively listening to them and you're making them feel better. I think that it's essential that we step back and support each other and support ourselves and say, I need to see the value in what I'm doing, but I also need to see the way that it pulls from me 
Um, and I don't think we've ever been able to do that in this industry. I think people are always like, oh, she's a hairdresser, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. and they don't see that it is like, okay, I'm also a psychologist counselor, right, right. you know, <laughs> yeah, this has been lawyer, you know, extremely difficult pieces. Totally. Yeah. I, I guess one of my first impressions when I got on the Rebels and Outlaws website and I started to like actually look at what you guys were making and I read all the intentions behind the candles and, you know, just everything that you just showed us in your demonstration. I have always been very connected to um, ritual and ceremony in other parts of my life. So definitely in my personal life with my circle of friends and family, um, I'm really connected to that. But I am going to be honest, like the idea of connecting that in such a major way to my makeup program, um, it was like a breath of fresh air where I was like, oh my gosh, look at how these things so beautifully align. And why didn't I ever see that connection, you know, in the way that you have brought it to the forefront with Rebels and Outlaws? So now sacred space with my makeup applications is a non-negotiable, you know, like creating that. and you know, I, in a way I was always doing that maybe without being so conscious of it, but being overconscious of it now and having tools to help remind me and keep me connected to that. Um, I just am so in love with, I, one of the things that I really was curious about is have you always had such a connection to different, um, be it pagan rituals and themes and this knowledge of crystals and herbs? Like, it's something that I've always had to really commit a lot of time of study to, but I feel like you are so well versed at bringing it down to what the candle or the you know product is about and how that connects to people's lives. Like that is a gift. How did you develop this uh, information around all of these rituals and bring them down into something that you can turn into such an awesome product? Um, you know, I think that, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so kind. Yeah. Um, I think that it's just always been a part of what I do. My family is, was very Catholic, very religious growing up. I grew up in an immigrant family. Um, my grandmother was very religious, Italian, Catholic, you know, going to church like every day and saying her rosaries and lighting her candles. And, um, but then like everything was with the help of God, but then she would do these little, you know, prayers and spells in her cookbooks, you know, for my aunts to have a, or hang the Hail Mary in the window so that it didn't rain on a wedding day or whatever it was. Yeah. And I think that those bits of, of spirituality and compassion and community were very important to me. My mom was very community oriented, even when we didn't have very much, um, when my parents divorced, you know, there was always a family at the table with us who maybe needed more than than I did. And so I always liked the idea of connection. Um, and I did study when I was young. I, I grew up in Rhode Island, so I'm about 45 minutes from Salem, Massachusetts. I took some classes when I was young, like all goth kids did yeah. with like... <laughs> Lori Cabot, who is the head witch of Salem. Um, But I think the deity connections are not really my connection. I think I'm very human. I think I'm I'm very much about people and their energy and um, their story. And I think that there's something about how I exist in this world where people trust me to share intimate details, sometimes in the craziest of moments. Um, (laughs) And I think I I appreciate the earth. And so when I look at things like herbs and crystals or food or conversation or someone sitting in a room, I think that I notice maybe and connect in ways that other people don't necessarily. So I think I look and I say, okay, well, even if you don't believe that a crystal is a healing element, you as a human, we kind of equate with tokens, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, even though I love the idea of rose quartz as a reminder of beauty and love and all of these things, someone else might not. But when they read that it does that, they're like, okay, I have to be mindful at this moment. When I use my potion as a smudge spray to like clear a space, my client may not believe that this lemongrass is about law law of attraction and attracting uh, positive things, but that switch in scent brings them to be mindful in the moment. And I think that that's the greatest gift sometimes is just connection and listening. So for me, it isn't necessarily about 
I do a lot of study and I take a lot of classes on herbology and, and different belief systems. And I do a lot of meditation on my own. Um, I do gratitude journaling every morning. I do breath work and, and so I have my own practices, but I think that my religion is people, you know, like I think that I, I'm a self-proclaimed like leftist, but I, th you know, I'm a leftist. I'm an activist. Rebels and Outlaws is an activist organization. I'm waiting for my like, you know, what? <laughs> it just. Uh, it, so I think that when you talk to people who are on the left, sometimes like my goal is how can I make the world better every day? How can I? look at the people around me and make sure they have something that they need. And I think when you think of spirituality as your connection to the people around you and your community and what you can do to make that community better, what you can do to make every day better for the people that you are connecting to, communicating with, how can I let the people that I love know every day that I appreciate them? How can I show gratitude every day for everything I've been given, even in a year where everything has been taken from me? I think that that is really where my study is. So I, I know that sounds vague and witchy and wellnessy. Yeah, no, it. it's, it's perfect. It's, it's, yeah. it's perfect. I, um, think, I think wellness for too long has been for like rich white women. Yeah, yeah totally. Like, for sure. That, like, I it's been a luxury. To bring a little, and... Like a little rock and roll edge to it. Yeah. Like, you know. Well, it definitely comes through. Um, you mentioned meditation. Do you have a favorite meditation or mantra that you can share with us? Uh, I have a few that I use. I basically every morning will start before I pick up my phone. I keep a gratitude journal by my bed. I try and be mindful in the moment and come up with some things to be grateful for. Sometimes something as simple as like my iced coffee, mm. but I keep it as a journal. So on the days that maybe I'm not feeling as grateful, I have the reminder. And then I will bring myself through meditation and I practice meditation every day. I am a terrible meditator. I have a very short attention span and I am like immediately distracted. So some days it might be something as simple as listening to a song that I love, but deep listening you know, for five minutes and just not doing anything else. On other days, it might be chanting. Um, I chant the Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Mm -hmm. On the days I kind of can't bring myself there, I listen to Tina Turner chant because yes. she has one of the best voices in rock and roll. <laughs> and listening to her chant is mm -hmm. like, uh, um, and then I have a book um, from Jessica Snow called 99 Meditations that are very easy kind of short guided meditations that I will bring people through or bring myself through. And I have an app on my phone called Headspace. And on days where I really only have a moment, you know, it, it's a practice. I think that that's the thing. Like I am not a guru. I am a terrible meditator, but I practice it. And I, I uh, love to share it because I think that as someone who does, and I'm very open about my dealings with anxiety um, I think that it also taking that breath in the morning, taking that moment for myself, kind of setting a plan in place for my day, being very actionable with my gratitude. It does put me in a different place for moving forward and allows me to take on even things that are uncertain because I'm sure in myself, you know, so I'm a big advocate of people meditating. However, it makes sense for them. I love this. We, the, an episode that we just released this morning is all about self-care and how that looks different for everybody. Um, and a big piece of that was just the morning routine, you know, mm -hmm. or the evening routine that, yeah. um, that those things that you do just for yourself to get yourself grounded and, you know, in a good headspace makes ripple effects all throughout your day. So I love, love to hear that. Um, I saw you guys were doing a retreat. How exciting. Oh, yes. And, you oh, know, it was yeah. funny when you were talking about Sold the retreat. Sold out like immediately. Like in, yeah, five days. Yeah. We actually booked another one right behind it. Like we're going <laughs> to do it again, I think. Um, so just saying you're more than welcome to come Holy sometime God. in the future. <laughs> um, I was thinking about it because you brought up the retreat that you and Michael do in Provincetown. And my first thought was like, I need to call and talk to them about hosting retreats and yes. pick brains about uh, all the things that you've learned. Cause yeah, that'll be our first rodeo with that. We're really excited. Um, so advocacy is something that you have been doing your lifetime over, you know, since you were 17 years old protesting yeah. in Washington, DC. And I feel like advocacy and protesting, especially in the last 12 to 18 months has 
like come to the forefront of so many people's awareness, you know, like there was obviously protests, you know, like if you're young, you hear about them in the sixties and you know, then there were riots in LA, you know, and so like, there's always been a level of that, but right now there's so much to learn about how to be a good advocate and how to protest for something that you feel strongly about. Um, so what has driven your passion for like social justice and motivates you to really want to be a part of uh, things when they're coming up like that? Um, I, you know, I have to say, to be honest, it's going to be probably not a, I'm looking for my quote. Um, it probably is not a popular answer, but you know, I, I really think that growing up in the church, um, really helped me to kind of figure out a lot of those pieces. Catholicism, where I grew up, is very active. Um, Rhode Island is a very Catholic state. It's like 78% Catholic. I don't think I knew people who weren't Catholic or Jewish until I was in college. But my church was very involved and my and it's very neighborhood oriented. So kind of your whole community knows each other. I grew up in a very small place. And so if one person was going without, the rest of the community would rally around and get them what they needed. Of course, you know, I think, you know, not to get super Catholic, but living the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Like, are we feeding our hungry? Are we visiting the sick? Are we counseling the imprisoned? Are we, you know, doing these things that are that are calls to action, regardless of what your faith is. Um, And my mom was a big part of that. You know, we spent holidays in soup kitchens and cleaning cemeteries. And, you know, my grandfather was a union man. He was an immigrant. Um, He loved this country. He, he lied about his age to get into the Navy when he was 15, you know, because he's an Italian immigrant. (laughs) He adopted this country and he loved it. And so I think we were very proud of our community. But you can't be proud of a community where the least among you is not taken care of. And so I started with action. And some of it was probably annoying, like probably the people I went to school with hated me. Like I started recycling programs and we had a group called Students Against Nuclear Destruction, where we would go to the longest running peaceful protest in Providence, Rhode Island every Friday and like hold up signs. And I got arrested at Electric Boat and I, I met my first boyfriend chained to the state house in Rhode Island, <laughs> oh like God. fighting for gay rights, you yes. know, but uh, activism I come from, I don't come from an activist family. I come from a family that is very compassionate and action oriented. My, my brother's a social worker, you know, my degree is social work. Um, But activism, I think as a queer person, activism was so rooted in my becoming myself that, and I'm sorry, because it does upset me. Like if there is someone around me who is being denied their right to exist or to speak or to be themselves. When I have fought so hard to be myself, I have to stand up for them. Um, It's why Jeremy and I are out in the streets constantly organizing, supporting, donating, um, because I think that we have a responsibility as humans and we have a responsibility as artists, right? Like art is a political act. If we are artists, you working with hair or makeup and people, it's a political act. And so we have to kind of do that. And there's a quote from Audre Lorde um, that I think kind of spurns my activism. And she says, uh, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. And so I think that is kind of me as an activist. Like as I've gotten old, I'm going to be 48 years old in a few weeks. So, you know, I don't know necessarily if like the the marching is is still my part to do, but I'm there as much as I can be. And I urge people to get involved, like no matter what your political leanings are, no matter what your personal faith is, you know, get involved in your community. If you want to do hair and makeup, you have to know your community. You have to connect to your community. If you want to build a business or a brand or a salon or a studio, you have to know your community. So why wouldn't you get involved at basic levels at schools and churches and soup kitchens and and see what you can do to make your community better? Because 
I think that's, I, I just, I don't know. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm rambling. No, and like, no you're speaking my language. Is so beautiful. Side. Yeah. I could listen to you talk about this <laughs> yeah, all day. Seriously. I'm just like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I will. I do want to say one thing. Cause I, I'm talking about myself, but Jeremy also like Jeremy's like anarcho punk from yes. Florida skateboard <laughs> kids. So like food, not bombs and like, you know, really actively involved in protest. And so I think that that's why there's rebels and outlaws because mm-hmm. I'm like the rebel and he's like the outlaw. He's the outlaw. So. That's so awesome. I think one of my first awarenesses of you guys being so active and advocating was uh, Jeremy getting arrested online. You know, like I saw you guys out somewhere in the mm-hmm. street, you know, and, and I was like, wow, like they, what I love so much about your approach to being an advocate for people in need, whoever they happen to be, is that you're walking the walk, you know, like you're not just showing up for the rant on social media or for the protest or the march that's getting the hot topic. Like there's so much more to advocating for somebody who isn't getting the respect, the rights that they deserve that you can do on such a fundamental level. And so I, I, really like to embrace this idea that, yeah, working in your community is one of the most rebellious, badass things that you can do. And that that doesn't require a huge movement to happen online in order for you to be a part of that. That's something that we can all do right now today is go out into your community and find somebody who needs help and then do that, you know, if you're capable and able. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it doesn't, I think a lot of times when people think about activism or advocacy, they think it's very leftist mm-hmm. and it doesn't like, you just need to figure out your contribution to your community. Maybe you are a hairstylist and you are donating 10 haircuts a week to a homeless shelter or, you know, right. Maybe that requires no political leaning nations. whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. But maybe you don't feel comfortable with that. So instead you're spending 30 minutes a week reading to someone in an, in an elderly home, because that's a, that's a little more comfortable for you. Or maybe you are making lunches at your church's soup kitchen, you know, or maybe you're collecting canned goods. You know, I think that like advocacy and activism don't always need to be so major in their moments, even going through your closets and looking for old coats and blankets and socks, you know, taking your uh, travel size amenities when you stay at a hotel and putting them in a Ziploc bag and giving them to the homeless people where you live. And I live in New York City, so we see it, you Mm -hmm. know, I think people who live in other places maybe are not faced with it so often. But I think there's so much that you can do to be involved using your skill set. And then if you look at it on the other end, not that we do this for the bonus and the benefit, but if you own a salon in your community or you are behind the chair in your community and you are out in your community volunteering at a church, volunteering for a politician you believe in, donating time at the library to read to the kids, people in your community start to know you and who are they going to go to when they need a service? They're going to go to this person who helps to build the community. And I think that that that's where communities become stronger and that's where individuals become stronger because all of a sudden it's not, okay, well, this is that salon that's on that street. It's, oh, this is that salon that is part of my community. And I think that that's a very different way to approach it. And I think that what we do in hair and makeup is so intimate and so engaging and aesthetics, especially, um, how can you function as an island? You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like the more people you know, the more people are going to know you and come to you for services. And if you can take that networking and make it about altruism instead of about internet postings, I think that's a kind of cool place to be. It's badass. Yeah, totally. It's, you know what, (laughs) advocacy is and standing up for things and raising funds for things. Um, I know in our salon, we're always like fundraising for something. And a lot of times it's environmental um, initiatives like April is Earth Month coming up. So we'll be raising money to create clean water um, all over. And that 
I started, I guess it was two years ago. I started with like a $20 a month donation to charity water, which builds wells all over the world for people that don't have clean water. It's so funny because I don't miss the $20. I don't even notice it's coming out, you know, like I've been giving it to them for years, but they send you the report at the end of the year. They send you like the GPS of the well where it's being built. And and like the names of the people that have clean water that don't have to walk, you know, like 18 miles for it anymore. And this is a charity that I know as well. Oh my God. God. It's so amazing, right? And that well, full circle, Shelly, who owns the makeup show, produces the charity water largest fundraiser event every year. Oh my gosh, I Uh, love that. What? Yeah. That's so good. So one thing we don't talk about, but every city that we go into, um, Shelly raises money and then she matches whatever money is raised for local women's organizations, charities, things like that. But Charity Water is one of her charities every year that she's involved with. Like she produces their huge event. Like that's so cool. I love that you guys. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, Cause we saw, I'm totally, his name's Scott. Scott Harrison, yeah. right? Scott Harrison. Yeah. Um, we saw him and his story is so incredible that, um, it just spoke to my heart and I am a big fan of charity water. That clean water is a human right. You know, like well, it, and it, we recently came across that in Texas with the snowstorm right. when I lost water and I was like, well, I never want to do that again. It was something I completely took for granted mm-hmm. and going that time without water was the worst. Yeah. And yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. My Texas friends thought I was crazy. I was like, fill up your bathtub with water. <laughs> fill every pan in your house. They were like, what are you talking about? It's just a snowstorm. I was Ooh. like, girl, fill <laughs> up your tub. Yeah, like, you need you. to flush that toilet. Uh, fill, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, we were melting snow is... for toilet water. Yeah, like, it yeah. was insane. <laughs> it, was it was the craziest thing. Never had to do that. And in then my it was life. like 75 degrees 18 hours later. It was yeah, really it was weird. weird. <laughs> Um, oh, our poor little planet. I know. Yeah, right. well, Mother nature's pissed. I No doubt. She's <laughs> letting us know what's what. I uh, I cannot say enough about the wealth of information that you have been no today. No kidding. I wish that podcast episodes were like three hours because we would just sit here and rip <laughs> forever. Um, to the point where I feel like we're going to need a follow-up uh, podcast at some point so we can elaborate on all of this stuff. James Vincent. We'll just do something for the retreat. Yes. Well, and actually, totally. so we're going to close out the show, but we want you to stay on Zoom just for a minute. We won't take up much of your time, but we are going to close up the show. Um, guys, we're going to put in the episode notes, all kinds of links and ways that you can keep up with James and Jeremy and all of their amazing adventures that they have in the world of beauty and makeup, definitely Rebels and Outlaws and different organizations that you can contribute to or volunteer your time to. Um, We are so very grateful for you being here today. Keep on with your badass self and you guys uh, go show some love to this man who is making it happen in the world. Thank you so much. Later, badasses.